Okay, last thing I want to do today um, is talk about the limit laws. Uh, in the law, just like everything, um, uh, if we can generalize these particular cases to more general concepts, um, then uh, we're better off for it. We can generalize the problem-solving method across a whole class of objects. Um, so let's talk about uh, some of the general limit laws. And, and along, in the end, we, we kind of know what these are going to end up being because we've actually looked at these cases in, more, uh, in, uh, in, in particularly instances. Um, but uh, let's look at uh, the most general types of functions and see what we can say about limit values. <coughs> so here's a, here's a limit. Uh, C is intended to be a constant. right? C is just a real number. So what is the limit as x approaches a of any constant value c? What does that have to be? Can anybody tell me? And about, you know, here x is approaching a, but since c is constant, it really doesn't involve x at all. So as x approaches a, what's happening to the constant value? Well, let's ask it this way. Let's look at it geometrically. Uh, this is the function um, uh, y equals c, where c is some constant. What does that graph look like? It's a line. What kind of line? What's special about the line that uh, is defined by... Okay, let's, let's go ahead and make it specific. How about the line y equals 2? What does that look like? Horizontal. Horizontal. It's a horizontal line. Looks like this. Whoops. Not quite horizontal. Pretend this is horizontal. There, it's a horizontal line. Okay, doesn't have to be two. Doesn't matter what it is. It's a C. Okay, so here's my limit point right here. I'm approaching A from the right hand side. I'm approaching A from the left hand side. What's happening to the function values? What's the function value equal to at each one of these points? C. It's never changing. No matter where I am on the uh, x-axis, the value of the function is always the same. Doesn't matter whether I'm far away, close to it, getting closer, getting further, it never changes. So what's the value of the limit? C. Doesn't involve x. x changing. Doesn't have anything to do with how this, in the, in, again, we can see it graphically. X changing doesn't have anything to do with this function's values. They're fixed. So the limit value must also be fixed. So for any constant, the limit is equal to itself. There's a picture, a geometric representation of why that has to be true. Okay, what about this one? As X approaches A, what's happening to the value of X? We're looking at this function, y equals x. What does that look like? This line? What's special about this line? It's a line that bisects the two quadrants. Right? It's a line with the slope of one that passes through the origin. Every point on this line has coordinate x, x. Okay. So, well, in fact, let me do it this way. Uh, so here's the point where x is equal to a. Where the coordinates of this point? A. So, what's the limit as x approaches a? In fact, it's obvious. As x is closer to a, x is closer to a. That's what this, in fact, maybe it's too obvious. Uh, x approaches a, x approaches a. There. Uh, so, as long as I can interpret these geometrically, there's really no mystery about why these limits work out the way they do. Uh, we can make these general statements now. Any constant has a limit that's equal to itself. Uh, it's uh, the limit of x as it approaches its limit point is the limit point's value. 
Um, and now uh, we can actually extend this in a much more efficient way. Uh, we're going to look at this in a much more general sense now. Um, here's a set of limit laws for combinations of functions and it really follows from what we just said about these constants. Um, but what we see here and the way that we express this uh, most commonly is that the limit passes through all operations. That's what we're going to say. The limit passes through all operations. If I've got two functions and I know the limit values of the two functions at any given point, then if I add the two functions together or subtract them, then the corresponding limit values are added or subtracted. Uh, if I multiply the two limit functions together, then the corresponding limits are multiplied. If I divide the two functions, then the limit value is the quotient of the limit values, as long as b isn't zero. Now, if the value of the denominator does go to zero, then we have a problem. But as long as the denominator is not zero, we can say, uh, we can draw a conclusion about this. Uh, exponents. And if I want to take, if I know the function's limit value and apply an exponent, then the limit of that new function is just the same limit value with the same exponent applied. And the same for root powers. Of course, root powers are equivalent to um, exponents, but uh, if I have a, if I apply root power to a function, then the limit value has that same root power applied uh, through that new process. Now, here we also have a problem, right? When we're talking about even powered roots, then we can't have a negative limit value. Uh, so these two restrictions on property of the real number system are things that we will have to account for. Uh, but outside of those restrictions, uh, the limit process is very well behaved. It is just, uh, it passes through operations in the sense that uh, the limits, the limit values themselves obey the exact same operations that the functions do. Um, so what I'm going to do now is something that we already know. We've already talked about the fact that in most cases the limit value is no different from the function evaluation. But what I'm going to do is I'm just going to show you for a very simple case based on these laws why that happens. So what I want to know here is what is the limit as x approaches 2 of this function. 2x squared plus 3x minus 1. Oh, by the way, what is it equal to? What is this? Can somebody tell me what this is equal to? 5? No, I don't think so. <laughs> Can you do it in your head? Can somebody tell me what this is? 13, there we go, yeah, 13, right? Where did that come from? Well, 2 times 2 squared. Well, 2 squared is... 4, 2 times 4 is 8, 2 times 3 is 6, 8 plus 6 is 14, minus 1, 13. So I know what this is. But let's show how all of these uh, rules fit together to actually establish that result. Number one, I've got three things being added together. So I can separate them in exactly the same way uh, as, uh, I mean, uh, again, this limit passing through the operations means I can apply the limit term by term. So this example here, the limit as x approaches 2, can be applied to the first expression. Then I can apply it independently to the second expression. And then I can apply it independently to the last expression. Okay. Um, now, I'm going to go in with, with inside each one of these and look again. Uh, in particular, this term here is a product of two things. So what that tells me is this can be broken down. I can apply the limit as x approaches 2 of the first factor and multiply that by the limit as x approaches 2 of the second factor. Same thing in the middle. This is a product of two functions, 3 times x. So I can apply the limit as x approaches 2 to the constant and then multiply that by the limit as x approaches 2 of x. And I've still got this limit down here at the end. There's nothing else I can do there. Uh, there's no extra operations involved in that expression, so that's going to stay the same. Now, most of this is as simple as it's going to get. Uh, this right here, nothing I can do there. Same here, same here. Uh, but I've got a power being applied to this middle term, or the second term here. 
or the second factor in the first term. So I can apply this rule. The limit can actually pass through that operation. So I've still got this limit as x approaches 2. And now I can apply the square to the limit as x approaches, it, uh, as x approaches 2. There's the limit passing through the exponent. Now I would never ask you to do this in all this detail. But this is an illustration of how that uh, uh, exponent, or how the limit is passing through all these operations. And in the long run, only those first two laws are the only ones we need. Because what I've done is I've separated this uh, polynomial expression into limits that are either being applied to a constant or to the value of x itself. Each one of those can now be computed. So here, the limit of the constant, that's equal to 2. Here, the limit of x, as x approaches 2, is also 2, and that's being squared. The limit of this constant is 3. The limit as x approaches 2 of x itself is 2, and the limit of the constant is 1. In the long run, all I've done is I've reproduced the direct substitution. Right? This expression here is nothing more than the 2 taking the place of the variable within the original expression. So that's a long, drawn-out process for an obvious result, but this does show us that these laws, and again, uh, we're going to take advantage of these rules as we move forward. In fact, the limit is one of the only processes in all of mathematics that passes through all of these operations. No other operator is so transparent uh, that it's this well-behaved. Um, in fact, I can't think, it's very, very hard to think of an operation that passes through multiplication. Now, uh, we've got distribution for addition and subtraction, um, but multiplication division, I can't, you know, it'd be very difficult to come up with an operator that actually satisfies this same behavior. I'm sure there's some, but I can't think of it at the top of my head. Okay, and so, uh, and here, and again, uh, we've already said this, we said it at the very beginning, but now we've got all of this background to justify why these things happen. We said earlier that in, in the typical context, the value of the limit is nothing more than its function value. Now we've got a whole set of limit laws to justify why those things are. Here's a summary of those results. If, for polynomials or rational functions, the limit value is the function value as long as the limit points in the domain. That's especially important for rational functions where we have to worry about the denominator. Uh, composite functions. We hadn't talked about function composition yet. We're going to talk about that a lot soon. Yeah. Uh, but uh, the limit passes through function composition. Um, we've got uh, Cosine, sine, the trigonometric operators, limit passes through those operations. We've got uh, the exponential, the logarithm, the limit passes through those operations. All of the operations in the end, limit valuations are nothing more than the valuation of the function. Right? Again, we already knew this, but now we've got the machinery behind us to justify it. Okay, what does this equal? Come on. X approaches zero. Two. two, right? Simple. Zero minus two, three times zero squared, minus two times zero, minus one, minus two over minus one, two. Done. Oh, yeah, here's a tough one. What is this equal? Negative one half, that's a good guess. No, that's right. He said that. Yeah, very good. Yeah, you do that. Very nice. Negative one half. Good. Uh, what's this one equal to? Yeah, two square root of two. We have eight. Hope everybody knows, right? We simplify this by separating out the square factor. 
2 square root of 2. Uh, these trigonometric valuations, these are important. We're going to need to be able to recover these. I know that some of us haven't memorized all those things. Uh, I, I will have a, a, a guide. Uh, you know, again, I'm not going to force you to memorize these things at this point. Um, but I do have the trig wheel that we use in our pre-calculus class. Um, I'll introduce that next week sometime. Um, and on the homework, right? You got a reference somewhere in the back, your background. You have a reference for those evaluations. That'll be good. How we do? Yeah, perfect. Good. Okay, so there we go. Uh, this is the first. Uh, this is our introduction to the limit, and um, uh, at least uh, the most typical sort of uh, uh, issues that we'll have to address. Um, next week, we're going to look at inf li the infinite limit. We haven't done a lot with that yet. We're going to look at the infinite limit in a lot more detail. There's a couple more limit laws we have to look at, and then uh, continuity. We're going to talk about uh, the, the issue of uh, con continuous functions. Um, and that's what we'll do next week. So a little bit more on the limit. Okay, so you've got homeworks one and two. One and two are going to be due on Monday. And the homework, the quiz that we have, again, short, representative of what you see in the homework. If you finish the homework, there won't be any, any surprises. Good. Okay, have a good weekend. I'll see you next week. <coughs>